My God is too big. You know, there's an old children's song. Maybe it's not that old anymore. I don't know. Maybe it's a young one. I don't know. But it's uh, my God is so big, right? So strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. And uh, I'm sure there's motions to it, which I always get wrong anyway. So I don't even attempt the motions anymore. But uh, this, is, uh, this is kind of the opposite uh, of what that song is talking about. You know, when we, are, when we are needy, when we have problems, when we have uh, things that, you know, we need God to supply, it's nice to be able to call on a children's song like that and say, my God's big enough to handle this. He's so strong. He's mighty. He can do anything. And we like to think of our God as big uh, in a positive way because God is someone who can take care of our problems. God is someone that we can rely on. And as someone who can help us out of a tough situation, he wants us to call on him. But um, when we look at this chapter in Job, of course, we know the circumstances that Job is in. Um, very bad issues that he's dealing with. He's gotten two, uh, two rounds of counsel from his first two friends at this point. And, uh, and Job is looking at this idea of the greatness or the bigness of God from a different perspective. And he starts with this question. It's really a rhetorical question in verse 2. And he says, how should a man be just with God? Uh, this word just, the Hebrew word behind it, sadak, is means to be righteous, to be innocent, to be vindicated. Uh, in other words, to have a proper relation to God's standard, to get to God's level. How do we ever achieve the level that God is at? Um, it's like I say, it's a rhetorical question, and he spends the rest of the chapter really unpacking the reasons why we can never really have a standing before God. We can never be at the place where we truly can be innocent, where we truly can be righteous. Based on our understanding of God, how could we ever really stand before him? Now, unfortunately, in our world today, and even in a lot of Christian churches, we see God being brought down to our level. We see his stature being reduced. We see sometimes his magnificence you know, kind of being tarnished in some ways because we want to think of him as the friend, the, the guy that we can call up on the phone and we have this hotline of prayer all the time and he's just there for us, you know. We can kind of, and you know what? God wants us to have that close relationship with him, but he never wants us to discount who he is in the process of our relating to him. He, he wants to be able to accept us and to have a right relationship with him. But ultimately, Job's question is justified. How is it that man, where we stand, can truly stand before a God at the level that he's at? And he begins by giving us a number of things through this chapter that he's going to unpack for reasons why God is simply too big for us. And uh, I want us to look at those this morning, starting in verse 3. He says this, He is wise in heart, mighty in strength, who hath hardened himself against him and hath prospered. Um, and verse, uh, back up to verse 3, If he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. The first point that Job makes here is, God is simply too smart. <laughs> God's too smart for us. He says if he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. In other words, if you ever got in an argument with God, you have no choice, no, no chance, right? You'd always lose. You ever get into an argument with somebody and you know this is always going to be, I'm going to be in the losing end. You know, they always can out-argue me. They always seem to have all the answers that I, I don't ever seem to be able to get through. The argument is, is going gonna, gonna to fall flat. Uh, someone who's smarter than you. You know, they used to have, I don't think they do it anymore, but they used to have debate teams, right, in high school or in college. And you would learn the, the art of, of debating and arguing and coming up with the right defense and coming up with a way to re recount against, you know, whatever argument somebody brings against you. And I think those are good things to, to have. I and mean, I think we've, we've missed that in a society. And he says, you know, if you ever got in a debate team and you were against God, he says, you may as well just go home. <laughs> You never win that debate. Uh, he would squash your arguments. You wouldn't even be able to stand uh, after he, he got done his argument. He says, you cannot answer him one of a thousand. You don't have the capacity, in other words, to answer one in a thousand questions that God might have for you. <laughs> That's what he says. 
Is you, you may be the brainiest geek in the world, the Einstein or the whoever he is, and you may have the highest IQ ever to known to mankind, but compared to God, he says, you're just too dumb. <laughs> you just don't have it. He's too smart. So the conclusion that Job makes from this, you know, God's too big. We can't outsmart God. Unfortunately, isn't that the problem with a lot of times we as mankind? Starts back clear to the Tower of Babel, right? We thought we were better than God. We thought we could outsmart him. We thought somehow we could attain God's, God's greatness. <laughs> we thought we could outsmart him in some way. The devil certainly thought that <laughs> when he decided to uh, go his own direction and got cast out of heaven. God is too smart. We can't outsmart him. Let's look at verses 4 to 6. It says he's wise in heart, mighty in strength. Who hath hardened himself against him and hath prospered, which removeth the mountains and they know not, which overturneth them in his anger, which shaketh the earth out of her place, and the pillars thereof tremble. You see some of the language that Job's using? He's basically saying God is too strong. God is too strong. He says, who's, had, who's hardened himself against God and prospered? In other words, who's ever said, I'm going to resolve to go head to head with God and, and I'm going to make any progress? That's what he's saying. You can't beat God in an arm wrestling match. He, he's, never going to, he's never going to let you win. He's too strong for you. It doesn't matter how hard or how tough you think you are. It doesn't matter how tough you represent yourself to people around you. You know, you go. You probably met some tough guys over the years. You know, these guys you come across, and you're like, "Hey, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna risk myself meeting him in a back alley." You know, this is this is the thought. But he says, "You could be the toughest, meanest guy ever," and you know what? God's still stronger than you. <laughs> Pharaoh thought that he would be able to harden himself and resist God. Right? Think about him with the people of Israel during Moses' day. What did God, what did the Bible say? Pharaoh had his heart hardened against God. Right? And uh, his heart was very hard, and it took a lot of plagues until he finally broke. God proved over and over again, doesn't matter how much you harden yourself against God, God will always be greater. The, then it continues, it says, He removeth mountains, and they knoweth not, which overturneth them in his anger. Do you know how many years New Enterprise has been digging at this mountain down the road here? <laughs> I don't know how many years he's been down there. And you, do, you could drive down here on 550 and you can look off to your left and you can see a lot of that mountain's gone. <laughs> but it's taken them a lot of years. And there's a lot of other mountains sitting there next to that mountain that they haven't touched yet. <laughs> and what does God do? He says, he removeth mountains. They don't even know. The mountain can be removed in, in just an instant of time. Compare, compare what New Enterprise has done with that mountain with Mount St. Helens. Some of you remember Mount St. Helens, 1981. Okay, uh, I remember it. Um, I wasn't that old, but I remember it. Uh, within a matter of minutes, right, the mountain just exploded, right? It blew up. It was no more. That's just a little bit of God's strength on display. He removed with mountains what it would take us a lifetime to do. <laughs> He does it in an instant. God is too strong. It says, He shaketh the earth out of her place, and the pillars thereof tremble. Speaking here about earthquakes. Do you know, we don't think about this a lot of times in central Pennsylvania, but there's many places in our world today where they are in constant fear of earthquakes. Constant fear that the earth underneath them will begin to shake, and all of the buildings and life that they have could come down in, in shambles in just a matter of minutes. Earthquakes are a constant threat for some, some places of the world. We don't have anything that can come close to the power of an earthquake. It can literally shake an entire city, entire region. You know, this is just from a New York Times article dated February of just this year. Uh, some new concerns have come up regarding the fault line that goes to the west coast of our country called the Cascadia Fault off the Pacific Northwest Coast. It says it's poised for a massive 9.0 magnitude earthquake at some point in the near future. It says a rupture of that size would propel a wall of water across much of the northwest coast within minutes. Low-lying coastal neighborhoods in Washington, Oregon, and Northern California would be under 10 feet or more of water 
with the, uh, the you're talking about a particular elementary school facing an inundation that could be 23 feet deep. It says, scientists have been warning for years that another catastrophic quake could erupt at any time in the Cascadia subduction zone, a 600 mile long fault that stretches from Vancouver, British Columbia to Cape Mendocino, Florida. It says, a quake from the fault located roughly 70 miles offshore could cause land along the shore to immediately drop by several feet. The sudden movement under the sea would send massive waves toward the shore, and while recent tsunamis caused by earthquakes and volcanoes in the Pacific Rim have resulted in small surges, on the west coast, this Cascadia wave would arrive at the shoreline within 15 minutes. The lack of evacuation means that the death toll could be almost unfathomable, far surpassing any other natural disaster in U.S. history. According to a 9.0 scenario, about 70,000 people would likely be within the lowlands that could be engulfed by the large tsunami. 32,000 of them would have no nearby high ground to escape to within 15 minutes. And the question scientists say is not if, but when. The chance of a 9.0 quake in this fall in the next 50 years is about one in nine. The odds are smaller of a little less powerful quake of 7.0 or 1 in 3 in the next 50 years. Just like that, 15 minutes, 70,000 lives could be lost right on our own coast. God is great. He is powerful. He commands the earth. He commands the mountains. He's too strong. This is what Job is saying. Job knew these facts about God. These were weighing down on him. And he continues. Verse 7. He says, which commandeth the sun, and it riseth not. He sealeth up the stars, which alone spreadeth out the heavens, and treadeth upon the waves of the sea, which maketh Arcturus, Orion, and Pleiades, and the chambers of the south which doeth great things past finding out, yea, and the wonders without number. So God is not just too smart. He's not just too strong. Really, God is too spectacular. God is too spectacular. That's really what he's saying. He says, you know, we understand mountains and things like this, but this is way even above us. <laughs> he talks about the sun. He says, he commands the sun, and it riseth not. Did that happen in Scripture? Yeah. <laughs> He did it for Joshua, right? You know, we've spent years just even trying to reach the sun. We still don't even understand the sun. Just this last year in December, the Parker Solar Probe finally reached the most outer outskirts of the sun and uh, began for the first time in history. They, NASA proclaimed that a spacecraft has touched the sun. We've gone through the outer layers. They've flown through the upper corona and sampled particles and magnetic fields. And, and according to NASA's website, it says, this new milestone marks one major step for the Parker Solar Probe and one giant leap for solar science. Parker Solar Probe launched in 2018 to explore the mysteries of the sun by traveling closer to it than any spacecraft before. Three years after launch and decades after first conception, Parker has finally arrived. Our crowning achievement, we've touched the sun. God commands it to stand still. God moves it as he sees fit. We spend years just to the sake we could get close enough to it. It's an amazing feat when you think about it. That's what he says. And, and then he goes on. He says, it's not just the sun. Let's go a little further out. He says, let's talk about Arcturus, Orion, and Pleiades. You know, most of us today, unless we're astronomers, we probably don't understand those words. But if you're a stargazer, you may recognize some of these terms. These are stars and constellations that were known even in Job's time uh, in the universe. He says, God made these things. And I think this is just a side note. I think this is an interesting point. Because a lot of times we have this mindset, I think it's been ingrained to us uh, through the educational system that we have and through the science that we have, that, you know, the more we progress as human beings, the more generations come along the way, the more we know, the more smart we are, the, the better informed that we are. And we think about these people that lived back in Job's age, three, 4,000 years ago, as like they're just, just 
kind of emerged from the Stone Age, right? They, they just invented the wheel, maybe, and, you know, maybe they moved out of their caveman, you know, huts and built, built something. You know, that's kind of our mindset, right? The older you go back in time, the dumber these people were. Job talks about <laughs> the constellations, the stars. These people had an innate knowledge, not just of what was around them, but things that were in the universe, and they had names for them, and they tracked them, and they understood these, these, uh, these concepts that, that we know in astronomy. These weren't primitive people with some undeveloped language and, and you know, no knowledge of science and the cosmos. Um, just think about it today. Arcturus, what we know about it, it's a giant red star in the northern hemisphere. It's the brightest star of the constellation um, Boots, and the Arcturus is among the brightest stars that can be seen from Earth. Orion, you've probably heard of Orion's Belt. Okay, if you've done a little bit of stargazing, you may know of Orion's Belt. It's a prominent constellation, uh, visible throughout the world. One of the most conspicuous and rec recognizable constellations in the night sky. And, uh, and then you have Pleiades. It's also known as the Seven Sisters, which is an open star cluster containing more than 800 stars in the northwest constellation Taurus. They look something like a small, hazy version of the Big Dipper. Now you're all gonna to wanna to go out and do some stargazing tonight. See what Job's talking about. Uh, look these things up. Job knew all about them. He says, these are magnificent. How did God arrange those stars? How did he put all so many of them out there? How did he make them bright enough that we could see them? Why did he do these things? Just because, because <laughs> he can. He's spectacular. He puts these things in the night sky. And that's why Job concludes, he doeth great things past finding out, yea, and wonders without number. Job's point in bringing out all of these examples is that God's wonders are too spectacular for us to even comprehend. We talked about the solar probe. We've never even begun to think about reaching Orion or Arcturus or any of these. They're just way beyond our reach, hundreds of light years away. And in thousands of years since Job's time to now, we haven't even begun to be able to study some of the wonders that God has put in our universe. Now that is spectacular. So what's Job's conclusion? God is too spectacular and we can't really comprehend him. We can't really comprehend him. Let's then look down to verse 14 to 18. Verse 14 to 18, he says, how much less shall I answer him? And choose out my words to reason with him, whom though I were righteous, yet would I not answer. But I would make supplication to my judge. If I had called and he had answered me, yet would I not believe that he had hearkened unto my voice. For he breaketh with me a tempest, multiplieth my wounds without cause. He will not suffer me to take my breath, but filleth me with bitterness. Let's unpack and kind of understand what Job is saying here. What is, what is the great lament? He's really talking about how, again, God is too superior. God is too superior. He says, if I were righteous, yet would I not answer, but I would make supplication. In other words, what's Job saying? He says, if I could attain the absolute best possible righteousness that I could ever imagine for myself, I would still have nothing to say before God. I would simply have to kneel before him and plead for his mercy that he might spare me in judgment. That's what Job's saying. Even if I thought I could be as righteous as I can imagine myself to be, I would still have to kneel before him and plead for mercy before him. He says, if I had called and he had answered me, yet would I not believe. He says, if I'm in that state where I'm just so righteous and I'm perfect before him and I pleaded before him and he were somehow to decide to answer me and I could hear his voice come back to me, I wouldn't even believe it. That's what he's saying. I wouldn't even believe that, that a God that big would even stoop to answer a pleading fool like myself. That's where Job's at. Of course, the accusations against Job by his friends were what? If you were really righteous, God would answer you. God would, God would come to your rescue. If you weren't doing something wrong, Job, you wouldn't be in this mess that you're in. We've talked about that in previous messages. And Job responds with, even if I was as righteous as I could imagine myself to be, I wouldn't expect him to come and answer me because I'm not worthy of that. I wouldn't even believe it were true. 
You know, I think sometimes we, um, we don't like to think of ourselves that way. <laughs> we, we don't like to think of ourselves as, you know, incapable, as helpless, as nothings. <laughs> but really, that's how God paints us <laughs> in Scripture. Compared to God, we are a nothing. <laughs> we, don't, we don't deserve anything. You know, I like some of the old hymns of the faith. They talk about this. Think about Amazing Grace. Uh, that, uh, that, that uh, saved a wretch like me. Remember the song? You know, we don't like to think of ourselves as a wretch, do we? <laughs> There's that other song that, uh, Alas, and did my Savior bleed by Isaac Watts. And he wrote, Alas, would uh, he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I. <laughs> you know, some of the old hymn writers had it right. We like to think about self-esteem and we like to talk about, oh, you need to build yourself up and, and you know, make sure that you have the right, you know, uh, projection about yourself. But the fact is, that's not a biblical attitude. We are sinners saved by grace. We are truly worms. We are truly a wretch. And even the best that we've got is still wretched before a God that's this big. That's why I... You know, unfortunately, there is a movement today to change some of these old hymns. And, uh, and we've got to make sure we don't allow this doctrine to go away. They've changed amazing grace instead of to save a wretch like me to that saved and set me free. Well, that's true. Amazing grace did save you and set you free. But that's not the doctrine that, I, that, uh, that was in the song. They've changed the song, Alas, did my Savior bleed, instead of in such a worm as I. They've changed the words for that one as well. And unfortunately, we, we're taking these things out of some of our old hymns. We've got to be careful with that. Because in the end, we need to see how desperately we need God. <laughs> how desperately our situation really places us before him. We need to understand that our worth and our value depends on him and not upon us. And I think that's a hard thing for us to get past because like even Chris was saying in Sunday school this morning, one of the great things about our culture is self-reliance, self-dependence. We, we can do it ourselves. We can pull ourselves up by the boot, bootstraps. We can learn enough. We can grow enough. We can be enough in order to achieve something. <laughs> that we might consider worthy. But the Bible says we are, we are not basically good people who can get pretty close to heaven's entry requirements on our own. No, we are people who need God's help to get us anywhere. <laughs> we can't go anywhere without his help. The conclusion that Job makes here out of these verses, God is too superior and I am too insignificant to even deserve God's attention. Let's look at verses 19 to 22. 19 to 22, Job says this. If I speak of strength, lo, he is strong. And of judgment, who shall set me a time to plead? Um, if I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall prove me perverse. Though I were perfect, yet would I not know my soul, I would despise my life. This one thing, therefore I said it, he destroyeth the perfect and the wicked. Again, what's Job saying here? God is, God is basically, he's saying, God, you're too sacred. You're too holy. He says, if I were to justify myself, mine own mouth would condemn me. In other words, if I was even in the process of telling myself or telling someone else that I was good, that I was righteous, I would find myself telling myself a lie right off the bat. <laughs> because... We can't be righteous. We can't be good. He says, if I say I'm perfect, it shall prove to me perverse. He says, I, I might be self-deceived. I might talk about my righteousness. I might think that I'm doing okay. Uh, and other people might see that in me too. But do you realize that our own lack of uh, understanding of ourselves is revealed in that? That's what Job is saying. My lack of righteousness will ultimately be played out. You might be a goody two-shoes, but I guarantee you there's a day where you don't put on the two good shoes. <laughs> and you start walking in the wrong direction. <laughs> That's what Job's saying. He says, though I were perfect, yet I would not know my soul. He says, even if somehow 
some way I was able to achieve this holy perfection that we know God to be. I wouldn't even have the capacity in myself to recognize it. Because I don't even recognize true holiness. I don't even know what true holiness, pure holiness, like God has, is like. Isn't this why God doesn't reveal his face to Moses? What does God say? Remember back in the days when Moses was, you know, very close to God. God talked to him and God gave him the commandments. And, and, and God says, hey, uh, I, wanna, I want you to know me greater. And, uh, and, I want, and I want you to know my purity and my holiness. And in Exodus 33, 20, remember, God says, I'm going to move past you, Moses. I'm going to put you in this rock, and I'm going to move past you, and you're going to see just the glory that trails behind me. He says, why? For Exodus 33, 20, thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. In our sinful, wicked condition, we can't even comprehend the holiness of God. We can't even stare in his holiness face to face and expect to be able to live through it. We don't put God on the holiness pedestal that he sometimes deserves. We don't always recognize his holiness. And do you know what? Because we don't recognize and revere his holiness enough, oftentimes we don't see ourselves as the sinful people that we really are. God is too sacred. His conclusion we are too sinful. Let's look down to verse 29. Verse 29, he says, If I be wicked, then why labor I in vain? If I wash myself with snow water and make my hands never so clean, yet thou shalt plunge me in the ditch, and mine own clothes shall abhor me. For he is not a man as I am, that I should answer him, and we should come together in judgment. God is too supreme. This is Job's argument. He's Job saying, why does it even matter? Why do I even try to keep doing what's right? If I could somehow wash all the sin in my life, take the snow water, not the yellow snow, the white snow. <laughs> so if I could take the wall of the white snow and somehow wash the sin off of me, get myself somehow purified and cleansed before the Lord, he says, I'm destined to sin again. I'm going to fall in the ditch. <laughs> That's what he's saying. I'm going to fall in the ditch again. I can't even stay clean. And God is too far above me. He's too supreme to even be able to have a conversation with him. How can we meet together in judgment? God is too supreme, Job says, and we are destined to fall short. Well, Job's conclusions are all correct. But I think the hope comes here at the end of the chapter. Job's conclusions that God is too big, that he can't be touched, that he can't be overpowered, that he can't be reasoned with, that he can't be understood or related to from this lowly place in which we find ourselves, that's all true. But then he gives us a glimmer of hope. He says in verse 33, which is something you may just have skipped past because a lot of times we, we miss these, these points, but the point comes together in verse 33. He says, Neither is there any days man betwixt us that it might lay his hand upon us both. Job says, The only way for me to approach God is if there were some type of daysman. We say, What is a daysman? I don't know what that is. We don't use that word very often. Well, let's look at the the, the Hebrew word, it's yaka, it means someone who would vindicate me. Someone who would argue on my behalf. Someone that could defend me before God. Someone who, who would, would take my chastening on himself. Someone who the charges against me could be lodged against him. The day's man. Sounds like somebody we might know. <laughs> the daysman. If only we had a daysman. If only we had an advocate who could cause mankind to be vindicated. Who could argue on our behalf. Who could defend us before the Lord. Who, who could do this on the basis of the chastening that he received on our behalf. Who could do this and allow the charges of sin and lowliness against mankind to be laid on him. Well, Isaiah tells us, by his stripes, we are healed. We know who it is. It's Jesus Christ. 
Only through this advocate, only through this daysman could we uh, ultimately do what, what Job is saying. He says, let, this, let, him take, let him take this rod away from me. Let this daysman. Let not his fear terrify me. Then would I speak and would not fear him. But it is not so with me. You see, Job had to look forward to a day when that daysman would come. He says, I can't do it on my own. I've got to trust in somebody that's coming that can be an advocate, that can be a mediator. And in fact, that's exactly what we found in Christ. We found the daysman. When God was too big and we were too small, Christ came as a mediator. He came to take the chastening for our sin. He came to bear the brunt of our punishment that we deserved. He came to give us the righteousness of God to put the robes of righteousness on, as the old song talks about, his robes for mine, so that God doesn't see us in the state that we're in. He sees us in the state of holiness of Jesus Christ. And that is the amazing thing about trusting Christ as your Savior. Our sins become washed away. God now is still too strong for us, but we can stand before him. God's still too holy for us, but we have a relationship with him. He wants us to come boldly before his throne, something that could only happen because of this mediator that we have in Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 2.5 tells us this, There is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. You know, we have a great hope. We have a great gospel message. The more we understand how great our God is and how small we are, the more we value that hope that we have in Christ. The more our faith means something to us. The more Christ's sacrifice truly, we realize the great cost that it, that it cost him. And the only hope that Job had is the same hope that we have in our circumstances. This great God, who once once untouchable in every way, all of a sudden can be touched. All of a sudden, we have an access to him that we never had before. We know that we are on his side, we are part of his family, and we are adopted forevermore to be with him. Now that's something that should take us out of any of the bad circumstances we're in and give us great and renewed hope.